Hey everyone, we know how hard it can be to keep up with the latest news in Israel, so if you haven't had the time to stay on top of what's what in the Holy Land, have no worries. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and this is ILTV's Weekly Review. That's it. The cutoff for submitting potential party lists for the 23rd Knesset elections in March has come. And of course, some submissions came right down to the so-called 11th hour, as last-second merger negotiations are reported to have continued until the very last seconds. With just minutes to spare before the deadline, Jewish Home Party Chairman Rafi Peretz has agreed to merge his party with those of Naftali Bennett and Betzalel Smotrich. And that means that the three of them may now control one of the larger right-wing parties after the March 2nd elections, just as Smotrich wished. But to make the deal happen, Peretz has been forced to break his two-day-old unity agreement with the far-right Kahanist party, Otzma Yehudit. In fact, the new right chairman and defense minister, Naftali Bennett, reportedly even resisted pressures from Prime Minister Netanyahu to include Otzma, citing Otzma chairman Itamar Ben-Gvir's extremist views, like supporting the actions of the 1994 Hebron massacre shooter, Baruch Goldstein. Ben-Gvir even keeps a photo of Goldstein hung in his living room. Meanwhile, apart from Otzma, not everyone in the new union is happy either. Under the new merged list, the Jewish Home Party's number two, MK Moti Yogev, is now number 11. And so feeling cheated, he's resigned from the party altogether. In related news, his comments have recently been characterized as irresponsible, utterly wrong and grave, ignorant, homophobic, and worse. And thousands of Israeli youths are now taking to the streets of Tel Aviv to demand a change. Jewish Home Party chairman and education minister Rafi Peretz may have made a good move dumping the extreme right Otzma Yehudit party in favor of a larger unity with the URP and the new right factions, but Peretz himself is facing harsh ongoing criticism now for his intolerant and anti-LGBTQ rhetoric. In a recent interview, he insinuated that being gay was abnormal, unhealthy, and counter to Jewish values, and earlier in 2019, he similarly came out in support of gay conversion therapy. Well, Justice Minister and Likud MK Amir Ochana has been among the first to condemn Peretz's views as reprehensible and based on prejudice, while other LGBT rights groups like Aguda lament that the education minister's short tenure will be marked by such hate. And finally, Wednesday evening, as the party list's deadlines approached, thousands of Israeli high schoolers were seen flooding into Tel Aviv's Rabin Square to protest. They made it clear, though, that they're not demonstrating for Peretz's resignation. Rather, it's against the way he, as an elected official, expresses himself. Now, Iran will achieve its military and nuclear ambitions within just two years' time. That is the word, according to the new IDF intelligence report published on Tuesday. And in fact, the IDF expects that the regime in Tehran will construct a nuclear payload within just one year from now. The good thing about JCPOA, and in all modesty, since I negotiated it, I believe it was one of the best deals that has been made in the in the recent uh, past one of the few major achievements of multilateral diplomacy less than a week after downing a ukrainian passenger jet killing 176 people on board iranian foreign minister javad zarif is now on tour around the world blaming the united states for the mistake and hailing the benefits of the now nearly completely defunct jcpoa nuclear deal the annual IDF's intelligence report, on the other hand, says Iran is closer to nuclear arms than ever. But there might be a silver lining in the death of IRGC Quds Force Commander General Qasem Soleimani. Soleimani was in charge of controlling and arming proxy militia groups all over the Middle East, including Hezbollah and Hamas on Israel's borders and the Houthi rebels in Yemen. And though Soleimani has already been replaced on paper, his loss is a great one for Iran. That's why, with Soleimani now out of the way, the IDF believes now is the best time to halt or even reverse Iran's influence in Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere. But Prime Minister Netanyahu isn't only fighting Iran's spread through military means. He's now again calling on the West, and in particular the UN, to follow through on its threats to reimpose sanctions on Iran for its violations of the nuclear pact. <laughs> The United States' so-called Middle East peace deal of the century is on its way, and before you say anything, I know, I know we've been burned before by several delays, but a top administration official is now confirming reports that the deal could come out in just a few weeks' time and irrespective, by the way, of Israel's third elections. White House National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien explains that the second half of the United States' plan had been delayed due to Israel's repeating political uncertainty. But with no end in sight, 
The Trump administration is apparently growing tired of waiting for elections to finish. And adding to speculation that the deal is finally coming is the fact that Avi Berkowitz had arrived in Israel last week for a series of senior-level meetings. Berkowitz is the new United States Middle East peace envoy, replacing Jason Greenblatt, who resigned. Now, we still don't know what the second half of this proposal will include, however. What we do know is the details of the first economic half of the deal, which was revealed in Bahrain in the summer of 2019, and it includes financial incentives almost exclusively for the Palestinians should they successfully conclude negotiations with Israel. Now, turn on the internet, let reporters roam free, and stop killing protesters. These are the words of United States President Donald Trump as he responds to the latest reports from Tehran that police are using live fire and tear gas against peaceful demonstrations. Massive, nationwide anti-government protests in Iran are now entering their third day, following the regime's admitting to the shooting down of a Ukrainian passenger jet, killing 176 civilians on board. And the Ayatollahs in Tehran appear worried. The demonstrations have quickly and publicly been picking up speed, and in spite of the arresting and killing of thousands of political dissidents, in fact, shooting victims have now been reported amongst the protests as police and plainclothes officers fire tear gas and live fire into the crowds. But again, this in turn has drawn the ire of the West now, with President Trump tweeting against the regime and Prime Minister Netanyahu issuing similar support for the protests. <laughs> Joining in with the economically inspired protests that started at the end of 2019, crowds across the state of Iran are calling for death to the dictator, or at least for Khomeini's resignation. Meanwhile, students at Tehran University are avoiding walking on the Israeli and U.S. flags while booing those who do. And now 21-year-old Olympic medalist Kimia Alizadeh, yet another top Iranian athlete, is defecting over the state's hypocrisy, lies, injustice, and, quote, oppression of Iranian women. How involved was Israel in the assassination of Qasem Soleimani? Well, apparently, more than we may have thought. Iranian General Qasem Soleimani has long been known as one of the biggest terrorists in the Middle East. And when he was killed in a U.S. airstrike, Israel certainly didn't mourn. Still, Israeli officials said that they didn't want to get involved. We weren't directly involved in the killing of General Soleimani, so why bring us into the war, they said. The problem is that it turns out that's not entirely true. According to NBC News, Israeli intelligence was key to the success of the assassination. Soleimani, as the head of Iran's IRGC Quds Force, was responsible for so-called unconventional warfare abroad like arming and conducting terrorist proxies like Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Houthis. And he was killed with his convoy after flying from Damascus to Baghdad, along with several other important pro-Iran officials. But how did the U.S. know exactly where to target the drone strike? Well, NBC now claims that informants in Damascus reported to the CIA which plane Soleimani was on. Then Israeli intelligence confirmed and verified the intel. In fact, the New York Times suggests that Prime Minister Netanyahu was the only U.S. ally to know about the attack before it happened. He and United States Secretary of State Mike Pompeo spoke just ahead of the strike. It was due to human error and U.S. adventurism. That is the excuse that Iranian officials are now giving to the world for the killing of 176 people on a Ukrainian airplane. And the world is not having it. We still can't believe this, so it, it happened two days ago and the whole community is in shock right now. So when you go online, you see the name of your friends, your family names, those people that you talked to the day before this event. So it's, it's still too early for the community yeah, yeah. to digest that. Yeah. 82 Iranians, 63 Canadians, 11 Ukrainians, 10 Swedes, 4 Afghans, 3 Germans, and 3 Brits. 176 civilians died in tragedy on Ukrainian Airlines International Flight 752, just minutes after takeoff in Tehran, when Iran fired a rocket at the passenger jet. Adding insult to the injury, Iran then lied about it. For days, regime officials withheld the black boxes of the flight as the families of the victims anguished over their loved ones' last moments. And now, finally, after independent investigation, Iran has come out with the truth. 
the Islamic nation of Iran fired a rocket on the jet. Well, as a result, thousands have taken to the streets in Iran and around the world to mourn the victims and to call for Khamenei's resignation. Some even chant death to the dictator. We will do everything we can to stand with you and be with you and to bring international support behind you so that the Iranian regime will be overthrown in 2020. And that's the message of today's event. 2020 regime change. Meanwhile, other Western powers are now also blasting Iran, especially Ukraine, which suggests that Iran never would have told the truth had Ukrainian investigators not been allowed access. EU aviation authorities are now diverting all traffic around Iran until further notice. Я закликаю всіх міжнародних партнерів України, всю світову спільноту бути єдиними та наполегливими до повного і остаточного розслідування всіх обставин цієї катастрофи. In other news, the rate of Jewish immigration to Israel, or Aliyah, has steadily been rising every year. But in 2019, the Jewish state also granted a record high number of citizenships to Palestinians. In fact, Israel has granted citizenship to over 1,200 Palestinians living in East Jerusalem in the past year, three times the number of 2018. But on the flip side, the number of citizenship requests that have been denied is also now at an all-time high. 1,361 applications actually were rejected in 2019 to be exact. And for reasons like not being able to, pr to prove East Jerusalem as residency, poor Hebrew fluency, and of course, security concerns. The sharp change in both approvals and rejections, however, isn't related to any new change in the number of applications. Rather, it's proof that the immigration authority is processing applications more efficiently as ordered by the High Court of Justice. Now, 27-year-old Israeli-American Nama Issachar is still in a Russian prison, sentenced to seven and a half years behind bars for drug smuggling. But to keep her spirits up, Sunday night she received an encouraging letter from none other than the Israeli Prime Minister himself. Altivis Chanafold has the details. Naama Issachar is running low on faith as she languishes in a Russian jail. The 27-year-old Israeli-American was changing planes in Russia on her way back to Israel from India when she was arrested. She was charged with drug smuggling after authorities claim she had a handful of marijuana in her checked luggage. That's a story she now vehemently denies. Her case has gained attention in Israel, with many saying the punishment does not fit the crime, and that she's being used as a geopolitical pawn. It is thought that Issachar's arrest is part of a bargaining technique that Russia devised in an effort to reclaim a Russian prisoner Israel had been holding in custody months ago. After court appeals and back and forth phone calls from Moscow to Jerusalem, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has sent a letter to Issachar saying the state of Israel is investing unending efforts to bring about your freedom. The PM went on to write, Israel never leaves someone behind. All right, now we've been covering this story for some time now, and this morning there's some movement regarding Israel's natural gas exports. Israel will start to send natural gas to Egypt, and that's according to a major announcement out of Cairo today, where a joint statement from the country's energy ministers was released. This historic move will also allow Israel to export some of its natural gas to Europe in the future as well. Israel is planning to benefit from Egypt's strong position in the gas world and to use their liquefaction facilities. The announcement was made today during a meeting held in Cairo called the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum. And the discussions there involved energy ministers from Israel, Egypt, Italy, Greece, Cyprus, Jordan, and the Palestinian Authority. The Mediterranean countries are also now working on a regional constitution that will allow for future collaborations. All right, now if you think that winter sports aren't a thing in Israel, think again. An Israeli skier has just made a big win, and ILTV's Nittany Manson has the scoop. Israel may not be known for its being cold, but yes, it does snow in the Holy Land sometimes. And yes, you can ski or snowboard on Israel's Mount Hermon, which has been caked with snow for the last two weeks. And now the Israeli team, Noah Zoloz, has just snagged Israel's first ever Winter Youth Olympic medal. The 16-year-old has just brought home a silver and a bronze from Switzerland, and it looks like she could have a big future in the sport. Noah was originally born in Hungary, but says she hopes she's made everyone proud at home. And it's safe to say that she has. 
Israel has only ever won medals in the Summer Youth Olympic Games in swimming, athletics, sailing, taekwondo, and aerobic gymnastics. All right, now the first hearing aid was invented in 1898, and more than 100 years later, researchers here in Jerusalem are changing history with a major update. ILTV's Nindy Manson explains what the news is. If you are deaf or have trouble hearing, this might be for you. A Jerusalem-based tech company called Orcam is winning awards and gaining recognition for its latest wearable device that can help you hear. It's more than just a hearing aid. The device can identify a singular voice out of many in a room and even uses lip reading and body gestures to figure out which voice the user is trying to focus on. When the person is ready to switch conversations, the device moves too, using artificial intelligence to detect which speaker is the new target. Another device from Orcam helps users by reading text aloud, whether printed or digital. The company's co-founder and co-CEO says the innovations are wearable, personal AI that have the ability to transform people's lives operating offline and in real time. In other news, it's one thing to hear and another very different thing to see, and that is why a new art exhibition at the Jewish Heritage Museum in New York City is so compelling. She began with the image of a snowman, but when life continued bleakly in the Terezin ghetto, little Helga Vaisova was told to draw what you see, and what the 12-year-old at the time saw was Jews forced out from a slave labor camp to a death camp. Then using colored pencils, she drew another of a barracks filled with young children, and then another and another. But before she herself was deported to Poland, Vaisova handed over her works to her uncle and fellow prison mate, and from there he was able to hide them behind a wall, saving them from would-be destruction. Well, the two above drawings are now on display at a telling exhibition in the Jewish Heritage Museum in Lower Manhattan. As for Vaisova, she's now in her 90s living in Prague and still paints every day. But she wasn't the only one etching images from within the walls of the camps either. And in fact, there are 21 images in the show, which curator Michael Morris says he found by accident. Morris received a request from another New York exhibition space seeking drawings, and when he went looking for the materials, he was struck by the images that he found there instead. Behind the statistics, and behind the numbers uh, and behind the scenes that we see hundreds or thousands of people uh, in concentration camps, that these are actual people uh, who had multifaceted lives. Now the space also offers works of a young engineer who created drawings meant to show the supposed progress and effectiveness of the Terezin camp for the Nazis liking. The drawings here show his resolution to picture the truth though, and he continued to make drawings of day-to-day -day life in secrecy. This image of eight men in coats, for example, is the first one that you'll see in the space. Rendering witness, Holocaust-era art as testimony, uses creativity in the face of depravity to share essential stories about life after and during the Holocaust. Finally, New York City is currently going through a spat of anti-Semitic crimes, and research shows that two-thirds of millennials in the United States don't even know what Auschwitz is. So Morris says that he hopes that the art will authenticate the stories of the more than six million Jews who died throughout concentration camps in Europe. And the show runs all the way until July 5th, 2020. Speaking of food, if there is one thing I'm always in the mood for, it's definitely knafe. And now one place in Jaffa has literally created a craze over the years old dessert. LTV's Emmanuel Kadosh went out to check it out. has been around for over 400 years, yet in the last year, there's been a knafe craze, and it's all thanks to Yafa Knafe. The knafe is from Batsek, which is similar to Kadaif, Gvina. It's a taste of Gvina in Bakar. We put it on the syrup of sugar, and we add it to it, and we add it to it with the chala and zim, and the fistukim. Knafe is a traditional Middle Eastern dessert popular in the Arab world and is influenced by different regions around the world. Knafe 
והתואר ממשיך ימינה עד המעבר חצייה בצד ימין, כשאתם פונים פה ימינה עד לשם. He's bringing us a new one, by the way. He said that this isn't, isn't good anymore. Because it's cold. cold. But we begged you to forever. Thank you. I got really concerned. I was like, where does she think she's going? All right, now one in three people around the world are diabetic or are pre-diabetic, and the numbers are expected to rise. But now for the first time ever, an Israeli pharma company is testing out a medication that could stop it or even pre prevent the disease altogether. Now, ILTV's Nittany Manson has the story. Out of the 463 million people around the world who suffer from diabetes, 95% have type 2. And that's exactly the form of diabetes that Jerusalem-based company Concenter Biopharma is hoping to prevent. And not with an injection or extensive therapy, but with a pill. Diabetes is the result of abnormal insulin production, which is a hormone made by the pancreas to stabilize blood sugar. And research tells us that the medications available today to treat type 2 diabetes do not actually solve the insulin issue. Zygosid 50 is the name of the new drug that might change that. And developers predict that it will do so without any side effects. Here's how it works. Zygosid is meant to reduce insulin resistance and also serve as an anti-inflammatory. The drug has been tested on a human patient who used the medication topically on his foot, which suffered from ulcers and psoriasis due to the disease. The patient claimed he had no negative side effects from the ointment. Concenter Biopharma believes the medicine in question will work well to cure type 2 diabetes and even stop it from taking form in people who are at risk, potentially changing millions of lives. That's it for ILTV's weekly review. See you next week.